Verse 4, for every house is built by someone. And in case you've forgotten, this house, the people of God, has been brought into existence not because of Moses, rather, but God is the builder of everything. It is a very clear reference to the deity of Jesus Christ as the creator of everything, a point that the author made very clear in chapter 1, verse 10, this same Jesus, as God come in human flesh, is the person who is responsible for bringing the people of God into existence, of whom Moses was one of us. And how did Jesus Christ accomplish this? By faithfully accomplishing His work as apostle and high priest coming to us as the divine Son to put away our sin. Does it need to be said, beloved? That's why He's worthy of more honor than Moses. That's why we must fix our attention on Jesus Christ and not allow ourselves to be turned to the right or to the left, even when the alternative seems to be something as wonderful, as glorious, as majestic as Moses. Now, I realize Moses may not be your struggle this morning, as it were, for these Jews. But, my dear friends, it is absolute foolishness to allow anything or anyone to direct you, uh, to, to divert you from your steady preoccupation of Jesus Christ. To do so would reveal on your part a failure to recognize His ultimate supremacy over every other person and every other thing. Why should your steady preoccupation be Jesus Christ? Because He's our faithful apostle and high priest. He's the builder of the house. Reason two, because Jesus Christ possesses an exalted status and position. Because Jesus Christ possesses an exalted status and position. Remember, among the Jews, Moses was the top guy. He was faithful, and uh, Jesus was faithful. But notice, beloved, that their faithfulness expressed itself in altogether different spheres. Look at verse 5. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Now, friends, the term servant here, speaking of Moses, is a very unusual term in the New Testament. It does not mean a, an ordinary, common, lowly slave. It means an honored servant. To be sure, in the house of God, among the people of God, Moses occupies an honored place, doesn't he? We're thankful for Moses and thankful for what God did through him. But as wonderful as Moses is, as a servant, an honored servant, that's not the same as being a son, is it? A son possesses an exalted status. Moreover, please notice the change in prepositions. Little words make a big deal. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. Meaning that he was a part of the house. Verse 6, Christ is faithful as a son. What's the next word? Over God's house. Moses was a part of the family. Jesus Christ is the one who rules. He is the Lord. He is the one who possesses all authority. You want to compare Moses and Jesus? Fine. It's the difference between an honored servant and a sovereign son. They both served faithfully. One serves faithfully in the house, among the people of God. The other rules over the house as the exalted sovereign son of God. And this is exactly what took place, beloved, at the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 says, And God placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church. Why should Jesus Christ be the object of your steady preoccupation? Because he's the one who occupies the most esteemed, exalted status and position. He is the son who rules over the household of God. It is interesting to note, by the way, that the author here indicates that the very nature of Moses' ministry was 
anticipatory. Look at it. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. And how did his faithful service express itself? Testifying to what would be said in the future. Beloved, everything that Moses ever wrote anticipated the coming of Jesus Christ. The law, the sacrificial system, the Levitical priesthood, all of the ceremonies, the tabernacle itself, all of it was to point people to Jesus Christ. And so you see, what kind of evangelistic approach does Philip take in John chapter 1 when he runs up to his friend Nathaniel and he wants to tell him that he's found the Son of God? What does he say? Nathaniel, let me tell you something. We have found the one about whom Moses wrote in the law. And what did Jesus say to the unbelieving Pharisees in John chapter 5? If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And following his resurrection from the dead, what incredible gift did Jesus Christ give to his disciples? I suppose if I could go back in time and experience one thing historically, it would be that scene in Luke 24 on the Emmaus Road. Jesus, and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Beloved, when you read Genesis through Deuteronomy, you must look for Christ there because he is there. And if you have not found him, you don't understand what that part of the Bible says. All that Moses wrote was aiming at Jesus Christ. He was faithful as a servant in God's house, pointing to the one who would come, the greater apostle, the greater high priest. Moses was faithful as a servant in God's house. Jesus Christ is faithful as a sovereign son over God's house. Are you going to give Jesus Christ up for Moses or any other thing or any other person? Could you imagine doing such a thing? Is he your steady preoccupation this morning? Have your thoughts been fixed upon him this week? Why should they be? Because he's your faithful apostle and high priest. Because he possesses an exalted status and position. 